just take the January 6th issue. Um, <clears throat> they have a statute uh, that says insurrection, all right, is a crime. However, of, of all the people who went into January 6th in the Capitol Hill, not a single one was charged with insurrection. They were charged with, you know, trespassing and things of this nature. But then when it comes to Trump, oh, it was an insurrection. And then you have people trying to block him from being on the poll. Oh, well, the Fourth Amendment says, so in, in other words, <clears throat> the whole idea of law is due process of law. You're allowed to face your your the person accusing you and you're entitled to a trial. They are skipping everything. Yep, that's All right? that's my point. There's no trial. There's no anything. He hasn't been found guilty of anything, but they want to remove him from office, preventing him from even running. On what? Nothing but allegations. Our world is changing rapidly. Many crucial systems we depend upon are collapsing. And the most important system that is failing is the food supply. But amidst the chaos, there is a path to resilience. I have the great Marjorie Wildcraft coming to the program. People who do not know her, she is kind of like the mother of ultimate preppers. And she's just, she's really good. I've spent decades finding the fastest, easiest, and funnest ways for the average person to be able to grow a lot of food. I used to be a hopeless gardener, but thanks to Marjorie, I'm growing food, and I'm really happy my family has more food security. Marjorie's webinar gave me the confidence to raise and process my own meat. Food production, and Marjorie, I want to thank you for the, the free webinar that you put out there at that website. I've already had uh, you know massive response from people that love your information and how you, you express the joy of learning how to grow food also, and in a small amount of space, when it really counts. So thank you for all that you do, Marjorie. If you go to sarahsbackyardfarm.com, you can sign up for that seminar, that free seminar. I'll have the link below. And so if you have the opportunity, check it out, sarahsbackyardfarm.com, and you will get a ton of free, great information. Welcome to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall. I have Martin Armstrong coming in the program. I He was by Marty, and he is just absolutely fascinating you're going to see how connected he's connected to world leaders he's connected uh, from and he knows milton friedman and he's going to talk a little bit about that they became friends and he also is really connected he knows klaus schwab he knows all these people and he has this conference where a lot of world leaders go to and he's going to talk about the geopolitical situation and the economic situation he's more of an economist and he's really smart and so you're going to hear a different angle on the economy and you know MIT says that we are deemed to collapse in 2032 but now it's been accelerated so what's really happening there we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about bank failures we're going to talk about what's causing all this and hopefully you're going to get something out of it it's very educational and interesting he's very good at history as well this is a long one so whenever it goes much over an hour i put the rest of it on my substack so you will be able to see that at sarahwestall.substack.com and like i say with everything because it's going to be uh for paid if you cannot afford a membership just let me know sign up for my membership just a free one and then respond to any posts and i get that and then I can help you get um, a free membership. What I'm telling people is please don't ask for a free one if you can afford it. But if you are on a pension or if you are in another country making five bucks an hour or something, that is who I want to be able to give free memberships to. Anybody else who can reasonably afford it, I mean, come on, you need to support me too if you are looking at this information. But I've given out a ton of free memberships now and uh, I will keep doing that for people who need help and want to see this information okay Sarah Westall that substack dot com let's get into this really fascinating conversation that I have with Martin Armstrong hi Marty welcome to the program well thank you for inviting me you know, I'm glad you're here. We have a ton to talk about. Everybody says you are the guru when it comes to economics and geopolitical situation. Uh, I want to talk about where we are, we're at. I just posted an article that branches, bank branches are closing all over the country. 
which could be meaning a shift to digital. So that we have to not sure how much we can read into that. But I also posted many times about the Weiss Research Group, who has, has historically been accurate over 99%, especially after the 2008 crisis. They're predicting over a thousand banks are imminently going to fail. And coming from an organization like that, who has a really good track record, it's pretty scary. And then also our credit ratings for the United States has gone down. Where are we at? We know this reset's coming. So where do you think we are at? Well, we're in the process of really a major um, reorganization, I would say, of, of the world economy per se. Um, our computer has been projecting uh, that for a long time, it, and the date is basically for 2032, uh, where I, I really think you're going to see the fall of, of Western forms of government in the sense of uh, republics, uh, that they call themselves democracy, but they're not. Um, um, you know, they just wage wars. Nobody ever asks us about anything, really. <laughs> so yet they have the audacity to call it a democracy. Um, <clears throat> And uh, we I mean, pay for it. Klaus, uh, pardon me. We pay for it. They just don't ask us. Oh, just yeah. take our money and do whatever oh, they want with it. Yeah, I mean, actually, I had I was up in Canada in Vancouver, and I forget the the politician's name, but it was uh, it was a woman, and she said that actually, I mean, she was pretty extremely far left. And she said, everything we earn really belongs to the government and they decide what we're allowed to keep. Uh, I mean, that's how drastic some of these people are. Total tyranny. Um, pretty much. And, and, and that's what comes out of the World Economic Forum. Uh, Klaus Schwab, I know I can tell you, um, he does have a bust of Lenin on, on his bookshelf. Uh, he's an academic and virtually practically all academics that are currently around tend to be left and um, they always want to control society and things of this nature and Can I ask you a question and, and Schwab, before you Schwab's get into that different. yeah Schwab is the same how many people who are academics once they go out into the real world stay with their theories because in business world, you know, because I taught at the business school at the Carlson Business School, it's pretty known that theoretical understanding of business versus actual practice and getting out there, you change your ideas, just like in medicine. If there's theory and then there's reality. I mean, how many of these people, these scholars that actually go out and implement change their idea? I mean, you know what I mean? It's it's kind of like there's the silo of universities and then there's reality and anybody that steps into reality realizes that this theoretical stuff half of it is bunk probably more than half <laughs> um i will i won't mention the university but um uh <clears throat> they asked they invited me to lunch and i went to see what what was really up and they asked me if i would teach there and i said no i'm not really interested in teaching but I was curious as to why they even asked me. And they said, well, we know what we teach doesn't work. I well, said, that's oh, pretty well, good, actually. That's that, you know, <clears throat> you're charging people a hundred grand to go there for degree, for something that doesn't work. But um it, the problem is is that they uh, are always, as you said, it, it's theory, and they don't get down uh to see how things really work. Uh, I mean, even Keynes was really following Marx, and the, the whole idea was that government can control everything and 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 eliminate the business cycle, etc. Um, but everything's in the business cycle, from climate to war, uh, shortages yeah. of wheat. I mean, are you going to pass a law to make it rain? You know, um, these are natural things that take place, and they cannot be eliminated by simply passing a law, uh, they can't. Um, so 
they're always trying this theory rather than looking at it realistically. And um, I was actually giving a speech back at a, I think it was the market technicians uh, conference in Chicago a um, long time ago. It, it was probably early 90s, late 80s, somewhere in that area. And I was really shocked that Milton Friedman came to listen to me. Wow. And he came came up and afterwards, and he shook my hand. And he said that was the best speech he had ever heard. And he says, you're doing what I only dreamed about. And I hadn't realized, but um, we became kind of friends after that. And Milton <clears throat> I did think out of the box. He actually wrote in 1953 about a floating exchange rate would be a check and balance against government. And <clears throat> of course, the floating exchange rate didn't come till 1971. But the fact that he that's what he meant, you're doing what I've only dreamed about. Um, what does he, he mean? Like he wishes long time. he wished he could be that open about what he believes. What does he mean you're doing what he only dreams about? That he was the one that actually contemplated floating exchange rates in 1953, um, rather than this uh, idea of fixed exchange rates, uh, gold standards, things of this nature. They don't work mainly because they tried to do what Marx was doing, you know, make it, you know, standard and doesn't move. I mean, um, I mean, Bretton Woods, I mean, I think honestly, a three-year-old with a pocket calculator could figure it was going to fail. I mean, you fix the dollar at $35, but then you keep printing more dollars. Doesn't anybody with a common sense realize, yeah. hey, you know, sooner or later, this thing's going to go bust. Um, but I mean, you look at the euro. I mean, the euro is the same uh, nonsense that, oh, if we fix the currencies and, and we just create one currency, uh, this will eliminate foreign exchange. Now, I know them because they came to me when they were forming it. And I warned them this was not going to work as well. Because all they were doing was transferring the volatility from the currency market to the bond market. Um, you know, and people are going to buy bonds or, I mean, each one has its own credit rating. Just same as in the United States. Fine, we have one currency, but you have 50 states and they're all rated differently on credit. Um, but these people constantly think that they can create this one world government. Everybody's the same. You know, it, it's just nonsense. Um yeah, and you'll have and, absolutely I mean, that's, no recourse, right? I mean, if there's like a handful of people making decisions for the whole world, you just, you're screwed. Yeah, because they can't, they they don't understand even how uh, society functions. Um, I mean, I was called in uh, for, you know, by the Brady Commission when it was investigating 1987 crash. And they put naturally an academic in charge. And um, I basically said, you know, you know, the first thing out of their mouth was that we're going to go find the guy that shorted this market and pushed it down and blah, blah, blah. Right. And I, and I just said, excuse me, every investigation since 1907 has begun with those words and nobody has ever been found. <laughs> um, there is no giant short position that, that overpowers the market. And I said, you understand how markets even function? And it's, well, I borrowed from this guy and I lent it to this guy. You know, I said, that's very nice, but how can you ever outnumber the longs? If you're borrowing the stock that from the first guy, he's still long. Then you sold it to somebody else who's now long. So how is this possible that some individual is going to be so huge and forces the market down? Uh, and, you know, I said, in futures, every contract's got to be matched. And I explained to him that effectively you you have, uh, if you've never traded, some news comes out, whatever, and everybody is long and they start to try to sell and there's no bid, you know, and the market will crash a thousand points. I mean, nobody wants to step up and buy a falling knife, you know, um, 
and I had met uh, the 89 crash. Uh, there was a, 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 a quite a wealthy Japanese guy who bribed his way into one of my institutional sessions in Tokyo. And he apologized. He says, look, I just really had to talk to you. He had invested $50 million. It was the first time in his life, and he bought the very day of the high. Oh. And now I said, you know. That's awful. I met that mythical guy, you know. Uh, and I asked him, I said, what made you buy that day? And he was in his 60s, I would say. And he said, it goes up 5% every January. And he watched it, and it always did. So he bought it December 1989. Of course, that was the high. Um, so when you have effectively brought in the very last possible guy that ever thought about buying, you've run out of you've run out of the energy. That's it. There's no more buyers coming in, and all you're now going to have is a panic to the downside if something happens. And that's what these crashes are about. You can't stop them. Um, and well, it, it's just the way the market functions. Well, they have managed to take down our economy, or they will be, by overprinting the U.S. dollar, right? Because if you print like madmen, you will deplete the value of the dollar to the point where everything crashes. So they are capable of doing that. That's about right. I mean, that's where we're headed. Um, yes, but it's not necessarily just the printing of the money um <clears throat> that idea has come from the the german hyperinflation but they don't really look close enough it was december 1922 when the government just seized 10 percent of everybody's assets mm. uh whatever you had in the bank they just took it because they needed money and they gave you a bond that's the hyperinflation begins in 1923, right after that event. And just ask yourself, if if suddenly Biden came in and took 10% of all your bank accounts, would you trust the government anymore? You no. know, that, that was the instant that started it. Uh, then the printing of the money came because everybody took their money out of the banks and went elsewhere. So it, it's it's not the printing that came first. It's like the chicken or the egg, you know. Um, the printing came as a result of the collapse in confidence. Well, they take 10% um, of your money, you take it out, so they can't take your money anymore. And that would have collapsed the economy if they didn't print a whole bunch more money for the banks. Exactly. Um, so then they, print the, they printed the money to meet the reparation payments and things of this nature. Um, uh, so it... The, the, um, and that significantly devalued the money that people did have at that point. Yes, right? they then they switched to just about everything from uh, rare coins, art, um, you know, real estate, uh, yep. and and many of them took their money and they they converted to other currencies. Uh, the, the same thing happened in Japan. The the government. Every time a new emperor would come in, he would devalue whatever the old current currency was, issued new ones, and says, oh, this is now the new one. This is worth more than the old ones. And so what happened was that people just stopped uh, using Japanese coins. Uh, they used Chinese coins and bags of rice. And you can you know, get a catalog on Japanese coins. They stopped issuing them for 600 years people just wouldn't accept them um wow. i mean that was the complete collapse of of confidence in in the japanese government wow um, well now do you see that that could be on our horizon of a complete collapse i mean the u.s government has done a lot of things lately that have completely eroded the trust you know not everybody there's still a group of people who aren't paying attention but a lot of people fundamentally do not trust this government. It, it's not just the United States. They're all in that same boat. Um, all the Western countries or, or other ones, pretty much Eastern. If you've been paying attention, you know the global economy is transforming. 
The BRICS nations want to see the end of the dollar reserve currency, and many countries are joining their effort. The Western banking system is the most fragile it's been since 2008. The highly respected Weiss Research Group accurately provided advance warning on which banks are going to fail with 99.3% accuracy after the 2008 crisis. They are now predicting that a whopping 4,243 banks are vulnerable to failure, and 1,210 of those banks face imminent failure. When this situation comes to pass, it will dwarf the 2008 banking crisis. The only asset that has historically weathered a storm this severe has been precious metals. It has never been a better time to buy gold and silver to protect your family. Contact Miles Franklin at info at milesfranklin.com. Tell them Sarah sent me and you will get the best service and the best prices on gold and silver in the country. That is a guarantee from them to me. Remember, info at milesfranklin.com. Tell them Sarah sent me. Do this now to protect your assets and the ones you love. Not not so much the Eastern, but clearly Western Europe, um, Japan. Uh, actually, the United States is in the best shape, uh, mainly because... Uh, it has the largest economy. And uh, you have to understand, uh, you know, the there is a stark difference between the United States uh, economy and Germany's, for example. Germany basically never tried to, to develop its consumer market. What it did was we build things and sell them to other people and bring in, bring back the money. So Germany was was working on what you would call the medieval mercantile type economy, whereas the United States was a consumer base. So that's why everybody wanted to sell here from Japan, um, you know, China, you, you know, Germany selling all its BMWs and everything. Um, that's what China is now has looked at very clear, clearly what type of economy succeeds and it's ours it's a consumer base uh and that's why china will surpass the united states but if you look closely the silk road they're built there they have adopted a consumer-based economy uh not like germany and that's why their their economic growth has been bigger etc and um but <clears throat> The, the real problem we have is that, um, look, I've been meeting with governments uh, for more than 40 years, and uh, it, it doesn't matter if I'm in Asia, United States, or, or Europe. It's, they're all the same. Um, and the real problem here is that they just keep borrowing money with no intention of paying anything back. That's right. You might as well just print the money. Okay, it would be cheaper. And uh, I know a lot of people owe printing money. We don't actually print the money. It's worse. Um, <clears throat> they are issuing all this debt. And then basically, on average, almost 70% of the outstanding national debt is a cumulative interest. That's right. If you would have just printed the money instead of borrowing it, the national debt would be far less than what it is today. Um, <clears throat> but eventually you, that comes to, to a head. Eventually you have to pay the piper. Okay, so what do you think about the Weiss Group's assessment that over a thousand banks are going to fail and another 3,000 are at risk? I mean, when well, is this going to happen? I mean, it, they, they're really good. So they're analyzing their books, they're analyzing the market, they're analyzing everything. And these guys are going to fail, guys. This is what's happening. Yeah, but most of them will be basically just bailed out. But uh, the the problem. Well, how is... do we hold on a second with that statement? Bailing them out. I want to hear your what the problem is. We in two thousand eight, we've already the banks that have collapsed have already surpassed two thousand eight. So barely, but they're about that. Now, if we have another thousand, we're going to just blow away what happened in two thousand eight. Are they capable of buying all those banks out? I mean, are we really that solvent? Because I know the FDIC doesn't have the ability to do that. It would have to be a bigger program. Actually, the Federal Reserve would do it. Probably maybe what they did in 2008, where they gave trillions away to foreign banks. But I mean, it's going to be almost too big, right? Well, what they do is 
<clears throat> most of those are, are just small banks. It's not the big banks this time. Uh, and uh, what you'll end up seeing is what we call shotgun weddings. <laughs> they, they basically go to one and say, okay, fine, we're going to merge that into this. If you look at Switzerland, um, <clears throat> they did that with Credit Suisse into UBS. But it was so big, UBS has not been able to really recover. Um, the smaller banks are, are, are different. This, this is <clears throat> where the problem has been that they invested long term. Um, most of these banks, they, you know, the traditional bank, it takes your demand deposit uh, and, and your checking account, but it, it <clears throat> lends out the money to like mortgages long term. So then when a, a financial crisis happens, there's a run on the bank because the bank cannot liquidate all those longer term loans to get the cash to repay immediately. Uh, so when you really look at it, for example, in the Great Depression, there were 9,000 banks that went down. How many? The first I'm sorry, bank, what did you say? 10,000? 9,000. 9,000. 9,000. The first bank that started the panic had the name the Bank of the United States. And it was a small bank. It wasn't really a big one. But people thought by the name, it meant the central bank, you know, the central, you know, government. Freaked et everybody so, out. And th yeah, that started the whole panic. Uh, but interestingly, the bank failed. It was taken over. And when all the assets were eventually sold, actually everybody got their money back. Um, <clears throat> so it, it's more of a liquidity crisis. Uh, <clears throat> we saw that in 98, too, when the, all the, a lot of the bankers and hedge funds were investing in, Ru in, in Russia. And when that crashed, they started selling assets everywhere else because they couldn't get out of the Russian bonds. So they're selling J Japan, they're selling U.S. stocks and things of this nature. So when you look at <clears throat> the fundamental research... Uh, in the United States, is why why is the market going down? It makes no sense. They're selling it to raise money for something else, and that's what you have to understand about a, a liquidity crisis. And <clears throat> Janet Yellen even came out and said, it would, but it went over just about everybody's head. She said maybe the Treasury should be involved in buying in the long term debt <clears throat> and swapping it for short term. Because there's a liquidity crisis. That's what really what she was talking about. <clears throat> and that you had a, a banking crisis in, in London where <clears throat> interest rates go up. So suddenly that's magnified. If you got a 30-year bond, if it went up 1%, you got to subtract 1% for the next 30 years. Uh, so Europe is in far worse shape than the United States uh, because first of all they took interest rates to negative in 2014 Jeez. and now taking interest rates up honestly there are very few banks in europe that are that are solvent to begin with because if they had to sell these long-term uh bonds they're down 30 40 percent but if if europe goes down we go down right i mean we're that connected or can we be insulated no, we are insulated from a different perspective. Um, the other thing that's that's actually supporting the United States right now are the the capital inflows. And the United States was bankrupt in 1896. It's when J.P. Morgan had to lend $100 million and bail out the Treasury and all that stuff. By 1914, the United States became the largest economy in the world. Why? Because of World War One, all the money fled to the United States. It was here, and that's what created the big boom into 1929 because of cars and the consumer. So the money just stayed here and invested. By the time World War II was finished, the U that's when the U.S. ended up with 76 percent of the entire world gold reserves. If tanks are driving down the street, blowing up banks in Europe, you're not going to leave your money there. So it all came to the United States. Mm, that makes sense. And now when you have the problem of uh, wars in Iran, Middle East, 
the money comes to the United States. That's what's propping up the United States. So you get all these people saying, oh, U.S. is going to, I mean, they, they should look outside. You know, the U.S. is actually in the best position. Um, uh, Biden is is out of control. And <clears throat> a pal even came out and made a statement. And you have to understand, um, I mean, I've dealt with central banks directly for, for years. And <clears throat> um, even back in 97, I was called in by the Chinese central bank. And they said, oh, you're doing a great job, you know, and I was saying the capital flow shifted because all the money's selling Asia and going to Europe to get in for the euro in 98. And they go, oh, you're doing a really great job. You know, I said, well, why don't you come out and like, you know, support me? At least say, yeah, that's that's correct. And even back then they said, oh, we can't come out and criticize another central bank. So this is the rules of the game. Then And... <clears throat> When Pal came out and just said a couple of weeks ago, this is unsustainable. The spending of Biden's administration is unsustainable. That is a monumental statement coming from a central bank. He's actually criticizing the Biden administration. They don't do that. The last time that was done was 1951. So that is showing you the seriousness that of it. It is. It, it, it's it, what Biden, the pro, it's not even Biden. He's just the puppet, just signs whatever they stick in front of him. He doesn't notes. even get it. I don't think he's even smart enough to understand the economic situation, but keep going. Probably not. Um, his administration is infected with uh, both neocons and climate change people. And activists. Uh, not, neither one has any sense. Uh, the neocons don't care about the economy. They just want always war. Uh, and the climate change people just feel that they have to shut everything down. This is their chance. And they don't understand. If you turned off all the fossil fuels in the world today, what do you think would happen? I mean, it would be a massive depression, civil unrest, riots everywhere. I mean, they don't understand the implications of what they're even saying. They almost need to take a test, an IQ test, to be able to serve in the administration. If you're going to be serving people. You have to be have a certain threshold of intelligence, and they have not met that. No, it, it's honestly they. The danger here is that you know you have these activist groups, and they just have one goal, yeah. and they. They don't understand how everything actually functions. Um, I mean, well, me a lot of these you. countries are really desperate. I mean, if you cut off fossil fuels, people can't will starve to death. They're yeah, going to riot. It's totally ridiculous. You you have to have something and energy to replace it. You brought up the year 2032. I there was a study maybe 10, 15 years ago from MIT. That year is relevant because they said it MIT said that if we continue on our trajectory, we will collapse in 2032 with, with our debt and just everything. Now they're saying from what I've read is we've accelerated that trajectory. Is that what you are talking about when you brought up 2032? Yes. What, what you're looking at is the collapse of these re Republican forms of government um, where they, you know, um, Unfortunately, I would say that, you know, they masquerade and say, oh, we live in democracies, which is uh, total propaganda. Um, you know, I mean, just look at Vietnam. You're 18 years old, old enough to get uh, drafted. You weren't old enough to drink and you weren't old enough to vote, but you were old enough to go die. Yeah, you can <laughs> die for us. They'll always do have you do that. <laughs> I mean, that's that's not democracy. Um, and I mean, wow. these people decide when we're going to have wars and who we're going to go against. And, and you know, do we, are we ever asked, shall we go to, you know, war against Russia? They don't ask that question. Well, um, they, they just they, do whatever they want. Yeah. And when they know the answer, when the majority of the people are against it, they censor it and hide it. And like what's yeah. happening right now in Gaza, the majority of the people are not for this situation. 
but they're making it they're they're making it true you know they're making it real through media and through all the propaganda that the majority of the people are supporting this when they're not yeah well mainstream media is basically has committed suicide really which is um, good yeah i mean i mean that was basic that was honestly you know lenin even said the the, the means to create you know in a revolution is you control the press that's right uh, and that's what they've been doing they've been trying to sell this uh you know this whole nonsense about everything uh <clears throat> but you know they create the wars it's not the people um you know the average russian wants to just support his family and take that's care right. of it just same with the average american it's it's the leaders who basically are always um you know poking each other back and forth uh but uh you know we have to understand this this is unfortunately the the result of a republican form of government that's why caesar crossed the rubicon uh and most people don't really look at it because they listen to the the fake news of cicero back then but um <laughs> they had their own form of propaganda it was all BS. oh yeah they did they know when they but finally... they, they become they become experts at it <clears throat> yeah when they finally during that revolution they cut off cicero's head um and they cut off his hands because he for what he wrote they nailed him to the roster and mark anthony's wife took her hairpin and pulled his tongue out and stuck it through it <laughs> that's well, how much think, they hate it well do you think that will happen here not necessarily that but do you think the mainstream media will be brought down in a more significant way because there are seriously uh, huge groups of people that are still swayed by them and all of us still are because they're controlling big tech now uh, look if, if the panic of 1869 they blame the bankers uh the the term black friday was really invented then uh they dragged the bankers out to the street and they hung them <laughs> that was black friday not a shopping day um and <clears throat> i think the next time what you're going to see uh, i certainly wouldn't want to be a journalist um i think they're risking their lives with this propaganda nonsense and when the people realize they're losing everything they're going to go after them um well and rightfully so right they're being they're blatantly lying to people and and COVID was the worst, where they were lying about treatments, lying about you know manipulating people to take something that's very harmful. I mean, there it's just now they're lying about the economy, and if you lose everything because they lie to you, I mean, I wouldn't want to be in front of that herd. Yeah, no, there have been riots that that stormed the uh, um, the, the journalists in London already, so. Um you you have to realize i mean a lot of them are uh told what to say and and that comes from down you know from the top of of the media organization which is just political that's um, right okay well I let's mean, talk even if you, go ahead disney what disney did to you know desantis oh don't say gay did, did anybody really look at what the law was you couldn't talk about it from third third grade it was ridiculous uh, for kindergarten up to third grade we're not talking about you know teenagers here i mean i don't think anybody you know has previously ever spoke about sex in kindergarten um, it shouldn't even be a i mean we shouldn't even be arguing this i mean the majority of the people exactly. this is so obvious so why are we even debating it i don't know i i think <clears throat> in part they just took that and assumed it's for everybody and then made this big thing out of it and if if you just simply looked at it i mean it was it was absurd absolutely absurd but it turned into this big political battle over nothing over nothing well let's talk about the time frame here because you know mit saying it was 2032 but now they're saying it's been accelerated and now uh, you know we have wars wars help every time there's a major economic reset over the last hundred and some years there's been some war or major event like this and so obviously it seems like they're trying to get us into war uh, 
can you talk about how war helps with this reset? Like, why do they always want to get into a war every time there's some kind of change monetarily globally? Largely because it's a diversion tactic. Um, and I mean, look, when inflation was going up, they were calling it, you know, and, and energy prices were going up because they shut down, you know, fracking and oil wells here. What did they call? Oh, this is Putin's inflation. <laughs> you know, I mean, as if he caused the oil to go up. I mean, it's Ridiculous. just, you know, it is. They, they always have to to point the finger someplace else. And war is <clears throat> typically something when the government is failing and they need an external enemy to get people riled up uh, all about that. Uh, and... <clears throat> It, you you know you you also have the danger of uh, many of these things taking place where what happens is that it creates tremendous resentment. I mean, I've been in Greece when they were protesting against you know Merkel from Germany just visiting. They were dressed up as Nazis and protesting in the street. They remember things. I mean, I was <clears throat> at a meeting in Yugoslavia before it all split up. And they were talking about, oh, oh, you know, they they killed 600 of us and threw us in a in a common grave. And I thought I missed something on the news. I said, oh, when did that happen? And they said, oh, about 600 years ago. I said, oh, yes, that one. OK. <laughs> um, they they remember everything. Well, let's talk about the depopulation agenda and how that ties into the economic situation, because if they want to depopulate in mass, then that just does a whole crash and burn to the the whole way that we're structured, especially economically. Look, I mean, that's the insanity of, of largely Bill Gates. Um, his, his father was um, the instigator of, of Planned Parenthood. Yep. But he was sticking them only in minority areas because right. he wanted to reduce their population. Um, and look, it, it's... It's, they pulled a good one, I think, on women. Um, you can look at um, uh, Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg, when she did a, a you know, a, a, I think in the New York Times, uh, she she commented when she went to the Supreme Court, um, Roe versus Wade had nothing to do with women's rights. It was all about reducing the population. And uh, that was it. So uh they've they've used it uh <clears throat> about oh, excuse me but <clears throat> they used it mainly like insurance uh i feel like i'm going to sneeze but <laughs> um if you buy uh, you buy accident insurance fire insurance you know they tried selling death insurance and, and, and pe people wouldn't buy it because they felt it was like you know maybe bad luck. So they changed the name and called it life insurance. Um, so the the depopulation movement, they just called it women's rights. And oh, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. They just flipped the, the name. They do this all the time. Um, and they will, you know, use different sayings and, 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 and flip what they're, you know, often to the, the exact opposite. opposite. That's right. Uh, you know, the to get people to do it. The woman, the abortion in our situation here in the States, I did a, a presentation at a conference and I did research on all the things throughout the last hundred and some years of what kind of programs they had for abortion and whatever. And all of them that had programs that were like ours today in states like Minnesota and California, whatever. They called it the their eugenics program. They called it a depopulation program yeah. and a eugenics program. But here we're hiding behind women's rights. But if you compare it to any of these other programs through history, at least recent history, they were honest about it. Japan, China, they were honest about it. And they called it eugenics and they called it depopulation. Mm -hmm. um, here <laughs> it's women's rights. And, and it's so frustrating. They have to sell it. You know? They have to uh, sell it. And and that's basically what they do. So the depopulation has been around for some time, but Gates is the one that's been pushing that uh, aggressively. 
and also, you know, the climate change. I mean, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever about CO2 doing anything. Um, I mean, well, it does do climate, something. It's it, plant food. <laughs> Keep going. Yes. But I mean, if you, they don't want to talk about anything before 1850. I mean, you know, we were coming out of the little ice age in the, in, in the 1600s. Um, John Adams even wrote a letter to his wife saying that the ground is frozen two feet deep and we can't even plant anything. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, by 1850, it was, it was, you know, just starting to really warm up and, you know, we were moving into the industrial revolution, but it's, you know, <laughs> They they distort everything. If you go all the way back, there was the Middle Age uh, warming period. If you look at all the empires rose during warm, warming periods and they collapsed during cold periods. Um, uh, the cold basically does two things. One, you can't plant, so food production declines. But two, that's also when diseases uh, come around. I mean, plagues usually follow that. People are mal, you know, have malnutrition. They can't; uh, they're more susceptible to to dying. So it's, um, I don't know, but I mean, if if you just be an unbiased researcher of history, you'll see, you know, the climate has always changed. It, it, right. It's not like Marxism; it's not always going to be the same every day. It's ridiculous. Well, let's get back to the economy. When you think we are at risk because people feel like we're all at, at the edge of this collapse when and we know that you know the studies and the research all shows you that we are in danger but what time frame are we really in danger and according to mit and others it's been accelerated so what time frame are we talking about is it imminent i know it's imminent but how imminent like next month next year three years um, our computer shows that you, the volatility is going to start rising sharply next year. And I think also the, <clears throat> you have to look at this from a confidence perspective. And what you're doing to Trump is, is so, so dangerous because you, you've divided the country. All right. And once you do that, I mean, you had Hillary saying anybody that voted for Trump was a deplorable. You, you don't do that. Mm -mm. Okay. This is the, civilization is when everybody comes together because we all benefit. Mm -hmm. When one group tries to oppress the other, you're tearing, you know, the very basic foundation of civilization of, apart. And uh, just look at what they've done to Trump. Normally they think criminally charging somebody their credibility will decline. That's why they went after him. But it had the exact opposite effect. Why? Because people knew it was political. Well, and, and they also are sitting there, the people who are accusing them of this stuff, the people know that they're guilty of even worse than what they're trying to go after him for. Well, yes. I mean, but the whole thing comes so it makes to it a point. Absurd. Yeah. Uh, our computer showing that from a, a timing perspective, um, it looks like, you know, the 2024 election is going to be probably the catalyst that starts the unwinding of a lot of things. Because I don't care who wins, nobody's going to accept it on either side. Uh, and so no one's going to trust the elections. Is that the case? Like the. Oh, absolutely. No way. Um, uh, it, it's. It's absurd. I mean, all the polls show that Biden is down dramatically. Um, but how and, many people I mean, won't accept Biden losing? I mean, do we really have a huge, there'd be a really small minority that will believe that Biden didn't lose? I mean, because most people know, right? Or, or is there enough? Go ahead. As it stands right now, um, the computer actually projects that Trump should win. And you're seeing this actually on a global scale. If you look at Argentina, you look at uh, Brazil, you look at Germany and Bavaria, uh, they're the AFD one. In all cases, it's against the status quo, 
which has been extremely left, um, yep. like the Biden administration. And not a single newspaper has ever called them a return to the middle. All right. It's all, oh, far extreme right. <laughs> um, as if they are the middle, you know, it, it's it's pathetic. But well, uh, all that's of us I mean. who are in the middle, maybe you're on the right. I don't know. But all of us who are in the middle, me, I've been recategorized as uh, as a far writer when I never yeah. really was. And I think that's pretty common. I mean, a lot of the people who were on the left, but more in the middle left have found themselves being categorized on the right, even though they were on the left their entire mm -hmm. life. I wasn't. Yeah, I mean, I was more in the middle. I don't know yeah. what if, what's extreme right anymore. I mean, I don't know. Uh, is that just it has an no outright meaning. terror? Or something or what? Yeah, it has um, no meaning, right? Because we're all on the right no, and we're doesn't. not with them. Yeah, it's, that's pretty much what's happening. Um, the AFD in, in uh, Bavaria, the headlines are, oh, extreme right, you know, wins. What were they fighting for? Uh, reduce the you know immigration please um i mean i have friends there they will not even allow their daughter to go walk to the bus station because fear that they would get raped i mean it's just so bad over there in many areas well um, sweden right sweden with all the immigrants now they're the rape capital of the world yeah it's you've introduced a different culture where women wear burkas, etc. So any woman that's not, hey, that's like you know fair game, you know. Uh, otherwise, she would be covered. I mean, but you know, but this is how they were raised. They would stop that quickly if they actually enforced the laws. And if a woman was raped, they'd be going to prison right away, and it would be the most severe sentence that you can get. And they would wake up pretty quickly. But the problem is these leftist, um, these I won't even say they're left, the, these far extremists are not prosecuting these criminals. Well, it's, I don't know, you, you have people like Soros who who have this agenda that uh, there shouldn't be any borders at all. And um, basically it's communism, right? You know, yep. I went behind the Berlin Wall before it fell. I saw it firsthand. Uh, and- Yeah, so um, did I. It was really strange. It's a friend of mine, the day the wall went up, he happened to be a little kid walking with his grandmother on the right side of the street. So he became American, but the rest of his family was trapped no, and he wanted to go back to see him. And I said, yeah, I'll go. I'm going to go see what this is really about. And um, basically uh, his cousin, she would speak freely only when nobody was around. And as soon as anybody was close to us, it's like, oh, this is the government. They take such wonderful care of us, you oh, know, geez. blah, blah, blah. You know? It was like North uh, Korea. And it's, it's even like the videos coming out from Hamas. You know, you, you see the guy saying, keep waving. As if, oh, goodbye, have a nice time. Thank you for the, for the you know, little excursion, you know. Um, it's, I don't know. It, 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 they end up, twisting everything around possible and what's the objective here i mean civilization is when both sides work together we That's live right. together um, and but throughout history it the right is not the problem the right usually is you leave me alone i leave you alone the left is well. I don't like the way your your hair is. It, it shouldn't be. It should be parted the other way. You know? And you have to do it because that's what I want. The left is always the ones that um, are trying to change society, uh, and that comes basically from Marxism. Uh, and even Keynes was, it, was yeah. And they pe hold on one second because I just want to throw in there some of the the people on the left before all this craziness happened. They just, they were more for freedom to be able to express yourself how you want. That's what they thought anyway. And now those people are all recategorized on the right. The far left yeah. are the ones that want to control everything in your life. Yeah, they, they you know, coming out with more diseases. I mean, the who wants to be able to dictate uh, everything on a global scale. I mean, this is, 
absolute nonsense and it does not work it will only lead to um civil wars and, and civil unrest which is all going to start more or less after 2024 um do you think we'll I have mean, an election some people think we won't even have an election it's it is questionable i'll put it that way um they can uh do what Zelensky does they are trying to desperately create a war before the election and, and and do you think that will postpone the election then they do they're looking at their playbook and say that if we can create a war and they don't really care with who um then no president has ever lost an election during war I think and it'll be different this time but keep going I, I think it would be yes uh and if it still moves in that direction then maybe they would use the martial law and the problem is is that they already have allowed numerous terrorists in uh through the southern border and even the FBI has come out and warned about terrorist attacks domestically yeah there's over 80,000 people of in special interest coming from countries that don't like us or groups that don't like us that they just let in because they want that civil unrest that gives them the justification for you can't move uh just look at what Spain did uh during COVID you yeah. needed a, a permit to go from one town to the not to the other uh what do what do we do I mean obviously these people are crazy it's almost like they need we need to get these people out for our safety right I mean with these yeah for us to be safe these people need to go they are they see this as their 15 minutes of fame and and they are just simply trying desperately to they think if they can force their ideas upon everybody then they win and it's not going to be sustainable that's what our computer is showing is complete um change in government this will be the end of republican forms of government after 2032. okay well let me let's um, explore that what comes after a republic form of government because a republic is supposed to be you know a representative republic where the people actually have a voice which we already said they don't but in theory we have a voice what comes after that then a true representative uh, republic or total oh, tyranny yeah no not a republic at all but more or less going back to a um the Athenian direct democracy um, okay where people actually did vote should we you know but they voted on major issues uh you know That'd did we go good. to war not war things of that nature so maybe uh, it's and, it's a they're they're moving the de the democracy uh, instead of just being a representative that does that they're going to try to have people vote directly you think on everything I mean that's the whole point yes, about the a representative is there's so many issues that people need a representative to help vote but you're going to say the major issues but then we still have representative kind of a cross no I would not do not accept any representative form of government whatsoever um when the when the founding fathers created it there was no salary all right and they only met maybe six weeks of the year that was it once they started paying themselves salary in 1855 and they did that over the slavery issue they said well we'll give you x amount full time all year if you vote in our direction mm -hmm. so they okay. were buying votes uh that's and then ever since they pay themselves uh everything under the sun um well, they all come I mean, out millionaires, been, right? The more powerful ones all come out multi-millionaires. Yeah. It's it's quite amazing, but you know they they come in with earning, you know, with very little money. Even have declared bankruptcy like the Clintons, you know, and um, yet they are still worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and nobody ever questions why or how. Um, but you know in in the real world uh my son was getting a a, a part-time job at a brokerage house when he was in school to see how it was working and basically it was everything about what 
stocks he would own, what I would own, anything, you know, and it, it was like not just him, but the whole family, you know, in politics, it's not that way. Nancy Pelosi goes, oh, well, I didn't buy that stock. My husband did. I mean, they have different rules for themselves, you know. Um, uh, they look know. At, you know. It's so BS. Biden, Hunter Biden get, t- right. gets tens of millions of dollars and gives them to Joe's, you know, uh, brother and stuff like that. But, oh, but that's not me. You know, that's it, very nice. But, um, <laughs> and we all believe I that. Mean, it, the, it, the public is pretty naive, though. I mean, we're waking up. This is the wake up process, right? We're learning not to be so naive. Hopefully, yes. Uh, <clears throat> Well, you are fascinating to talk to. I could talk to you all day and we could talk. I mean, there's so many topics. It's, you're so well versed on so many things. And then you have that that foundational understanding of economics to back it up. So it's really fascinating to talk to you. So again, what is your website and where can people find you? And if they um, want to go to your conference, how do they do that? Uh, well, we have events page on there. And we go just go to the site, uh, armstrongeconomics.com. And they can look there and you, they can see when we will be having an event. Uh, like I said, it will probably be um, Mexico, Dubai, or London. Well, I got to go. So I got to, you got to tell me about it because this would be an interesting event for me to go to. So, okay. Well, they're well, like a mini UN. You get to meet so many people from around the world. They're, just, they're almost like a college reunion. That would be good for me. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for inviting me and good luck.